bad. When I sat down and started putting the highlights together for the last lecture, I realized I pretty much buried you guys last time. So, yeah, you should have slowed me down. Anyway, um, there's a lot of information here. And um, it is uh, important that we get through it. But it's also important that we get through it in a way that uh, you, you know, can digest it and understand it. So. Um, I want to, uh, and I thought what I would do today is just back up, what's that? Uh, I thought what I would do today is just back up a little bit and sort of reiterate some of the things that I said about the process. I think the process uh, of translation uh, is important. And specifically, I'm thinking about going back through initiation, elongation, uh, and termination. So, uh, and we've got the time to do that, so I think I'd like to, to, to make sure that's taken care of. So, um, when we look at translation, as I said, the very first thing, of course, has to happen is that we have to have the charging of the transfer RNA with the amino acid. And those are done by ACL, amino acyl um, um, tRNA synthetases. I can't, I can't spit it out. Uh, and they're specific for each amino acid and for the appropriate uh, tRNAs that they go on to. Um, after things have been charged, uh, we can start thinking about the process of initiation. And initiation is, um, as are all process, all, all parts of the translation process, very, very orchestrated. Um, I am sparing you uh, details of uh, some of the stuff here, but I just want to, uh, again, just sort of reiterate, sort of go through these things a little bit so that um, hopefully it's a little bit slower paced, things will uh, register with you a little bit more. The um, process of translation happens um, after complexes have been assembled. So we don't have ribosomes floating around in the cell, already assembled, waiting to look, find something to translate. Okay? So every time that translation happens, the ribosome has to be assembled on the uh, messenger RNA. So the messenger RNA is a starting point, And then the various factors come together to basically build that large subunit, small subunit structure uh, of the ribosome that I've described to you. Now, there are uh, large subunits and small subunits floating around in the cell. So we don't have to orchestrate every single thing. There are, there's also a, um, a way in which they are assembled, but we're not going to consider that as part of the translation process here. But instead, we need to consider after that we have the large and the small subunits how we put everything together. So that's really what's happening here. The initiation phase, um, as I noted last time, uh, requires three initiation factors. Initiation factor one, initiation factor two, and initiation factor three. And I didn't really say much about what, what one and three do. And for our purposes, we're not going to worry much about that. The interesting initiation factor um, here for our purposes is initiation factor two. And that initiation factor two, you notice it has a little GTP beside it, uh, indicates it's also a G protein. It is a protein that's carrying, um, in this case, uh, guanosine triphosphate. And uh, using the energy of that as a way of uh, making the uh, process work. Well, what's it doing? Well, this IF2 is actually doing two things. One, it is carrying that initiator amino acid into the P site. The initiator, remember, is the 4-milmethionine attached to the appropriate uh, tRNA. Like all of the amino acids, this guy has a very unstable bond. It will break down in water. And as you might imagine, IFT, uh, I, I'm sorry, IF2 will protect that bond from water, which it does. Okay, so it's protecting the bond from water. And it's ensuring that it is coming in and pairing with the AUG that is in the P site. The P site really isn't marked here, but there is a P site that's there. So when IF2 comes in and gets all of that done, it looks at this and says everything is OK, that's when IF2 uh, cleaves its GTP to GDP and leaves. And that happens concomitant with the addition of the large subunit, as you see here. Now, these really have to uh, happen fairly much at the same time. And the reason, again, is we don't want to expose this to water any more than necessary, because we're going to lose that bond if we do that. Okay? So um, 
as you can imagine, putting all these pieces together and keeping water away from there is a, is a challenge. Uh, but when it's all finally done, we are done with the initiation phase. At that point, we have the two subunits together, the large and the small. And we're ready to move to the elongation phase. In elongation, um, we, um, that's where most of what we think of as protein synthesis is actually occurring. And this figure shows us the sort of sequential, uh, what I call shuffling, that's happening of the ribosome um, with respect to the two large and small subunits are shuffling with respect to each other, and they're shuffling along the messenger RNA. Okay? So um, we see the E, the P, and the A sites all sitting there, and we see the incoming amino acyl tRNA. It comes in. It's being carried by EFTU that I talked about. And EFTU, I noted two things about it. One, it's um, the most abundant protein in E. coli. And two, it's a G protein that protects that bond. So its function in carrying in that tRNA is kind of like the function of IF2 was for this guy. That is, it carries it in and makes sure that the anticodon pairs properly with the codon that's there. That's important, OK? As I noted before, if it recognizes that they are properly paired, then EFT will cleave its GTP leave and get out of the way. And if it is not properly paired, it will exit dragging the tRNA with it. Okay. Now, what's kind of remarkable to me about this is we think about the process of diffusion. Everything that we talk about that happens in cells at the molecular level depends on diffusion. And we have to have the right um, tRNA diffuse into that site. We talk about the EFTU carrying it, but all it's really do is taking a ride on there and riding this diffusive pathway that leads to this. So diffusion is a relatively random process, and so we're waiting for a relatively random event to happen where we get the right thing in there. We would imagine in the macroscopic world that ra relatively random events would happen relatively slowly. Um, and I guess on a time scale, these are relatively slow. But it turns out that this process can occur, that is, getting the proper amino acid in and all the stuff that you see here. This process can occur at the rate of about 17 amino acids a second. Okay. So about 17 properly paired uh, tRNAs. Does that include improperly paired ones? Yeah. Yeah. OK. So there's a bunch of pairings that happen that aren't the right ones, and they leave. But there's 17 proper ones that come in and uh, ensure that we get the proper pairing and the proper peptide bond formed. Now, I point that out to you. I meant to men mention this to you on Monday. Uh, but I point that out to you because if we think about the process of translation that's happening here in E. coli, I said it's 15 to 20. I said 17. But 15 to 20 uh, amino acids per second are being built into that protein. And if you think back to what I talked about with respect to RNA polymerase and the rate with which it worked inside of E. coli cells, I said it was roughly 50 to 60 nucleotides a second. We think three base pairs per, or three bases per codon. It means that translation and transcription in E. coli are occurring at roughly the same rates. Roughly the same rates. So that's useful because if translation went much faster, it would be bumping into the RNA polymerase. And if it went much slower, then the um, transcription would finish, and we'd have a long piece of RNA hanging out there with ribosomes trailing along uh, behind it. So uh, not coincidentally, they happen at about, both at about the same rate. OK, well, in this process, uh, the most important uh, feature of what you see on the screen is the pep formation of the peptide bond. And as I noted last time, the peptide bond forms. Uh, it's catalyzed by um, a reaction that is uh, inherent to the 23S ribosomal RNA in the large subunit. And that catalysis uh, creates this structure that you see here. We see the first of the shufflings that has actually happened in the process of getting uh, to this. We have what is now the head of the green guy here in the P site, where the head of the green guy was over here in the A site to start. So this has shifted over. So we've seen a shuffle that happens. And the next thing that has to happen is we have to shuffle the ribosome along 
that messenger RNA. And in doing that, what will happen is we get that green codon, in this case, into the P site of the small subunit. Well, that movement of the ribosome uh, down the messenger RNA requires uh, action of a second G protein called EFG. It's an e I, I'm sorry, a second elongation factor called EFG. It's also a G protein, and it also uses cleavage of GTP to GDP to provide the energy necessary for that movement along the messenger RNA. I should point out that, as I did last time, that translation occurs in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction, and that corresponds to a synthesis from the amino end to the carboxyl end of the uh, polypeptide chain. So the very last amino acid that will get put into the polypeptide chain in translation is the addition of the carboxy terminal amino acid in there. Okay, well, this process continues uh, cyclically uh, until a stop codon arrives in the A site. And when that happens, as I noted uh, last time, then we uh, encounter the process of termination. In termination, we have things called release factors. You see one here called RF1. There's also another one in E. coli called RF2 uh, that uh, basically carry water up to this point so that water can be added across this bond right here to break it. So that's what's happened right here is we've added water across this bond. The polypeptide that was here is now floating freely. A question I commonly get is, at this point, has folding already started? And the answer is, yeah, for many proteins it actually has already started. Okay? So folding it doesn't happen only after we release that polypeptide chain, but in fact is probably occurring as the polypeptide itself is being made. Well, at this point we have everybody is empty there. There's no amino acids left. There's three tRNAs that are left. The ribosome uh, basically comes apart. Okay? So now we, uh, and there are factors that will facilitate the uh, separation of the large and the subunit. We don't need to worry about those uh, especially. Uh, but suffice it to say, at this point, we have completed uh, the process of translation in E. coli. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say last time, maybe in a little bit slower fashion. And uh, I hope that uh, made a little bit more sense for you as I said it uh, here. Um, I'm going to say a few things about eukaryotic translation. Uh, and mainly what I'm going to do here is point out some differences to you. I've uh, alluded to those as I've gone along. But uh, what's interesting is that the overall process is surprisingly not very different from that of E. coli. Maybe it's not surprising. I don't know. It's not very different. There are a few changes, and I think that you should indeed know the differences uh, between E. coli translation, er, I'm, I'm sorry, prokaryotic translation and eukaryotic translation, E. coli being a prokaryote, of course. Well, in eukaryotic uh, translation, we have a couple of, of considerations that are different. Now, you're going to see when I show you these figures a whole bunch of different uh, names of things, uh, and they're not even specifically laid out much here, but when you go and see initiation factors, you look these up, you'll see that the eukaryotic ones have different names. For our purposes, it doesn't really matter. We're not going to worry about different names for them. They perform the same functions. That is, that they help to assemble the ribosome, uh, along with the messenger RNA, just like we saw in E. coli. One of the differences that we see in eukaryotic um, translation is we don't have a shine delgarno sequence. Okay? So if you recall, in prokaryotic translation, the shine delgarno sequence was a sequence in the messenger RNA that was close to the initiator AUG. And the purpose of the shine delgarno was to form hydrogen bonds, base pairs, with a, a sequence in the 16S ribosomal RNA in the small subunit so that the AUG got positioned properly into the P site. Now, that doesn't happen in eukaryotic cells. That might seem a little confusing, but the answer is it's not overly uh, complicated. It's actually simpler in eukaryotic cells in the sense that the very first AUG that appears from the 5' prime end is usually the place where translation starts. So basically, this, pro this thing has to sort of skim along until it encounters the right AUG, or the first AUG, as you see here, and um, 
then the process of assembling the ribosome can continue. So an a, uh, a Schein-Dogarno sequence is not really needed in eukaryotic cells. There are around the AUG in eukaryotic cells some sequences that commonly appear, but for our purposes, again, keeping it simple, we're not going to talk about those. So the first AUG is basically where translation starts in uh, eukaryotic messenger RNAs. Um, Another difference, and you see it right here on the screen, is that the very first amino acid in eukaryotic cells is not 4 methionine, but actually methionine. Now, I briefly alluded to that last time when I said that the 4 group was put onto that very first one because it turns out that that very first um, alpha amino group uh, can be reactive with the translation, with the thing, what's going on in the translation process. And so unless it's covered up, then um, you don't get efficient translation happening. Okay. Well, why don't we have it here? It turns out that the eukaryotic ribosome actually functions automatically to cover that up. So you don't need a chemical group to cover that um, alpha amino group as translation is getting started. So again, in a sense, eukaryotic translation is simpler uh, from the perspective of the various things that have to happen in order for the process to uh, go forward. Just like in prokaryotic um, translation, the uh, initiation phase is complete when we have an initiator transfer RNA with, in this case, a methionine on it that's sitting there in the P site. Okay? Then we're ready to move to the elongation phase in eukaryotic translation. Now, you'll notice I have no links here for elongation or for termination. And that's largely because there's not uh, significant differences uh, in these processes, at least at the level that we're examining things. So we will treat elongation as occurring essentially the same in uh, prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells and termination as well. Now there are some factors to consider with respect to termination in uh, eukaryotic cells that we don't have to think about, uh, or that we have to think about in prokaryotic cells that we don't have to think about in eukaryotic cells. Um, but I'm actually going to save those until I talk later uh, today about gene expression in prokaryotic cells. And you'll see what I'm referring to when I get to that. One of the things that we do see, however, that's different about the overall process of translation in eukaryotic cells is there's a structural difference that's interesting and odd at first glance. Okay? And that's shown right here. All right? So what we can see is here's the 5' prime end of the eukaryotic uh, messenger RNA. We remember that the eukaryotic messenger RNA has a modified 5' prime end and it has a modified 3' prime end. At the 5' prime end we had this structure we called a cap and at the 3' prime end we had this poly A tail. And it turns out that both the cap and the poly A tail play roles in the translation process in eukaryotic cells. Okay? First of all, and so you can see some of these different names here. This is the eukaryotic initiation factor 4E. You don't have to worry about that name. Okay? It's an initiation factor. All right? um, some of the roles include the following. Okay? The ribosomal complex looks for that 5' prime cap. Okay? The cap is recognized and it's necessary for translation to occur. If you don't have a cap on there, translation of that message will not occur. All right. So that's uh, a very important uh, consideration structurally. So that's one way of flagging, hey, this is, this is a sequence that you need to translate because here's the cap that's sitting on there. The other thing that you notice as you look at this, and what you see here are ribosomes sliding along this messenger RNA. And yes, you will usually have more than one ribosome on a given messenger RNA at, at any given time. So this is not unusual here. You see it's an 80S complex in comparison to a 70S, but it basically we have the same snowman structure. The other thing that you see, though, is at the 3' prime end, we have some proteins that have bound to that poly A. And more importantly, they are interacting with some of the initiation factors, as you can see here. It makes a circle. Now, you might wonder why would you want to make a circle to do this? And the answer appears to be that by making a circle, the ribosomes, when they get over here and hit a stop codon and start coming apart, don't have to move very far to restart protein synthesis over here. Whereas if this guy is a long messenger RNA, which it could be, the end would be very long ways away from the start, 
and it would be a much less efficient process occurring. So this circularization that happens in eukaryotic translation appears to improve the efficiency of reinitiating translation once a given ribosome has finished. Okay, so, um, so we can see now the function of the cap, we can see the function of the 3' in, and because of the interactions that happen between these different proteins, we can see, of course, that we have a circular structure that arises as a result. Okay, questions about that before I move forward? Okay, well, let's um, uh, think about translation in a different way, all right? One of the things that we're interested in, in understanding biology, is how we can use our knowledge of biological processes to our advantage. And one of the prime advantages of um, what we um, have done with our knowledge of translation is use um, some of uh, that knowledge to create antibiotics that can preferentially kill uh, one set of organisms. Okay? Now, what I've described to you so far is that, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of similarity between the way prokaryotes do translation and the way eukaryotes do, tr do translation. But there are, as you've seen, some subtle differences in size of the ribosomes. And you might imagine that there would be some subtle differences in structure of the proteins within those ribosomes. And there are. And so those differences in structure get exploited by making antibiotics that will, or making compounds that will interact with them and stop the process of translation. So if you identify a structure, for example, that's unique to a prokaryotic uh, cell for translation, and it's not present in a eukaryotic cell, if you can make a molecule that binds to it and inhibits its function, then what you've just created is something that will kill preferentially prokaryotic cells but have no effect on eukaryotic cells. Okay? So several antibiotics, in fact many antibiotics, actually target translation because as you can imagine, if you stop translation, the cell has no way to, no way, no way to live. Okay? It needs proteins to live, it needs proteins to catalyze reactions, it needs proteins to divide, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, some of these that you can see here on the screen uh, are shown. In fact, there's a list uh, I uh, got for you here. Streptomycin, tetracycline, chloramphenicol, cyclohexamide. Uh, some of these work on, uh, inhibit actually both eukaryotes or preferentially eukaryotes, like cyclohexamide, for example, um, uh, nails eukaryotic cells. Okay. Imagine we want to kill people but leave bacteria unharmed. I'm not sure if we want to do that too much. But actually in the laboratory we do because we want to uh, be able to preferentially uh, study a process in a eukaryotic cell. So it turns out to be a useful tool in the laboratory. Not too useful outside of it unless you're a bioterrorist. Um, anyway, but you can see just from the short, very short description, and no, I'm not going to ask you to memorize what, which one goes with which, but you can see the uh, descriptions here, like streptomycin, for example, inhibits initiation and causes misreading of the messenger RNA. Well, if that's interfering with the ability to read a messenger RNA, okay, then, we, then a, a bacterium could not, for example, make a specific uh, sequence of amino acids, which would be necessary to make a specific protein. Tetracycline binds to the 30S subunit and inhibits the binding of amino acyl tRNAs. Again, you can't put amino acyl tRNAs in there. Uh, you can't translate. So uh, some very cool uh, approaches uh, that are done there. Pyromycin, and, uh, I, I frequently describe, causes premature chain termination because it looks like an amino acyl tRNA and the ribosome treats it as such, but when it goes to make the peptide bond, everything falls apart. So it's really fooling the ribosome into doing something that uh, stops the process of translation. Okay, now if you look at uh, these molecules, they have structures, that's cool. <laughs> you thought I was going to say something about that, didn't you? Okay. Uh, but we can also see uh, some relevant things up here that we don't think of as antibiotics. One is diphtheria toxin. One of the reasons that diphtheria is a very serious uh, disease is it makes a toxin that uh, stops translocation. And Yes, that will stop translocation in your cells, okay? So we can imagine there would be some real problems arising from that. It's used as a research tool, and obviously we want to stop diphtheria from uh, spreading. Ricin, which is uh, a bioterror agent, it's actually been used in bioterror attack in Japan a few years ago, um, is a, um, an N-glycosidase that cleaves adenine in the 
uh, ribosomal RNA. So it's actually altering the ribosomal RNA. And by the way, eukaryotes have a larger ribosomal RNA than prokaryotes do, but you don't have to worry too much about that. And it stops it from binding elongation factors. So this guy is very deadly because, again, it's stopping translation. And uh, you can imagine there would be some serious consequences for that. OK. Now, the last thing I want to say about translation is something that's unique to eukaryotic cells. And this something that's unique to eukaryotic cells uh, relates to the fact that eukaryotic cells actually have organelles. Prokaryotic cells, we think um, about what does a prokaryotic cell do? Well, I've described their, their insides as basically a sort of uh, cytoplasmic soup, and that's basically it. Everything is embedded in that cytoplasm. In eukaryotic cells, we think about the fact that we've got uh, mitochondria, we've got um, uh, endoplasmic reticulum, we've got um, lysosomes, we've got all kinds of organelles that need specific proteins. And um, I've described earlier one of the ways in which they get there is by a phenomenon I described as targeting. But what I haven't told you is how they initially get inside of uh, an appropriate organelle. So that's what I want to tell you here. And it's actually what you see occurring uh, on the process uh, here. So if we have proteins that have destinations in the cell, maybe their destination is they get exported out of the cell. Maybe their destination is they're going to a lysosome or whatever. Those are made in a special place. They're not made in the cytoplasm. Okay? They're made um, in the endoplasmic reticulum. So what you see on the screen is, is um, an electron micrograph um, of the endoplasmic reticulum with what look like little dots all over it. And those little dots all over it are ribosomes that are synthesizing proteins. And they're injecting the protein into the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay? So they're not releasing the protein into the cytoplasm. They're actually putting it into the endoplasmic reticulum. Once it gets in the endoplasmic reticulum, those processes we talked about before, we had certain targets that said go to the lysosome, go here, those license plate things I talked about. Once it's in the endoplasmic reticulum, then it can be modified as appropriate to go where it needs to go in the cell. Well, how does it get, how does the ribosome know to go to the endoplasmic uh, reticulum? The answer is that the uh, uh, proteins that are destined to go into the endoplasmic reticulum to start um, have what are called signal sequences at their amino terminus or near their amino terminus. They're shown here in yellow. Okay? And these signals, as you look at these, if you go back and you look at the uh, individual um, uh, codes for these amino acids, are largely uh, nonpolar amino acids that are uh, at or near the 3' end. And there's usually a fairly uh, positively charged one that says, OK, you've got one of these sequences coming up. Okay? They're not identical. They're just, they have a commonality of being fairly nonpolar. This signal, as you'll see in a minute, tells the cell, get me to a ribosome. I'm sorry, get me to a, um, uh, the ribosome's already there. Get me to the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay. Well, this um, shows uh, something called a signal recognition particle. And the signal recognition particle is a complex that helps recognize this um, uh, uh, sequence that I've described to you and drag it to the endoplasmic reticulum. It's actually shown a little bit better here. Um, this depicts a messenger RNA that's being translated. Okay? And so if we look at the steps that's happening in this process, if we start here, we have a messenger RNA that is trans being translated by this ribosome. And we see the very first of the amino acids coming out of that ribosome. These uh, proteins uh, that are here, the signal recognition particles uh, that are here, will bind to, and if there is a sequence like I've described to you, fairly nonpolar with that positively charged amino acid just ahead of it, the signal recognition particle will bind to it. If there's not a sequence like, there, it, like that, it won't. So if the signal recognition particle doesn't bind, then this guy will go back out into the cytoplasm and do its merry thing. On the other hand, if a signal recognition particle has bound to that, this is now going to force everything to happen into the endoplasmic reticulum. All right? So we see the particle has bound here. We see on the endoplasmic reticulum that there is something called a signal recognition particle receptor, or an SRP receptor. And not surprisingly, it binds to 
that signal recognition particle. Okay? There's a little song and dance that's done in which the emerging polypeptide that's being made is pushed into this thing called a translocon. The translocon is basically a channel through which this polypeptide chain can be made. So we see right here at this point this forcing of the new polypeptide chain into the endoplasmic uh, reticulum. As translation uh, proceeds, uh, there is a, something called a signal peptidase that will actually clip this 5' end off. All of this, this 5, I'm sorry, this, this amino terminus. All that this amino terminus was used for was to tell the ribosome, put it in here. The signal gets clipped off, and the rest of the protein is made in here where it folds and goes and does its thing. Now, um, as a consequence of this, this polypeptide chain has been sent to the endoplasmic reticulum. It will fold, it will get modified, and it will get directed ultimately to its destination either inside or outside of the cell. Okay. Um, not surprisingly, we see that the signal recognition particle is a G protein. There's another GTP that's being done, uh, being uh, burnt to uh, make this process happen. There's actually, actually two, one here and one here, uh, that happens. And as a consequence, we have the uh, polypeptide delivered into the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, good place to slow down and ask for questions. Yes, back there. Yeah, how does the mRNA move? So when we think about the movement of this, we can think of the mRNA moving or we can think of the ribosome moving, right? Well, it turns out the ribosome is fairly st stationarily docked there. So that translocation process is actually pulling the messenger RNA through. And that's actually what happens in the real world anyway, okay? But that translocation process is just threading that messenger RNA through. It's a common question, actually. Jody? protein gets in there and gets folded and what have you, if the signal, the signal sequence has been cleaved off, yep. how is it directed to its appropriate location since there's multiple options from there? Okay, so Jody's question is if the signal uh, 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 sequence gets uh, clipped off, how does the cell know where to send this? Well, there's other things in here that will do that, okay? And there are modifications, if you recall, that happen in the ribosome. So, I'm sorry, in the uh, endoplasmic reticulum. These can include putting on uh, glycosal groups, uh, sugar groups and so forth that also play a role in telling it where ultimately it, it will end up. So, and the example that we saw when we talked about eye cell disease, if you remember last term we had eye cell disease, and in eye cell disease there was an improper placement of a mannose on there, and when that happened, proteins that were targeted for the lysosome didn't make it to the lysosome, and that's because these modifications that happened after this point weren't occurring properly. But yeah, there's a lot of modification that happens out here after this. The only purpose of this sequence is to bring this polypeptide to here. There's other sequences that will tell it where to go other places. Emily? Are the ribosomes that dock, are they the same as the ones in the cytoplasm? Yeah, very good question. So are the ribosomes that dock here the same as the ones in the cytoplasm? The answer is yes, they are. So the only thing that's different is whether this SRP binds here or not. So if it doesn't bind, then this ribosome will just go floating out in the cytoplasm and release that, that polypeptide there. Yes? I'm sorry? Is this why this is called the rough ER? Or is there the, oh, is this, why, why do we call it the rough ER? The reason people call it the rough ER is that the rough ER will always have ribosomes on it, and the roughness arises from the appearance of that, okay? So they're called rough because when they first saw them, they thought, whoa, that's really scratchy looking stuff there. Those that don't have ribosomes on there will not, in fact, look rough, and they're, they're called smooth ER. Okay, other questions? Okay, good there, let's see. Was there anything else I was gonna say? There are some, some of the processes, you've sort of seen this before also, but some of the processes that can happen, uh, budding off of the ER, going to uh, lysosome in this case, going through the Golgi, either to outside or to other organelles uh, as appropriate. Okay, that's uh, a good place to stop and sing a song, I think, so let's um, do that. This is a very important song. Okay, so this song uh, I need your cooperation on, and I need everybody to stand and place their hands on their heart. Please, this is a very serious moment. Please. And the reason I ask you to do this is, you know, 
we're all patriots, right? You know, we, we respect our flag, and when we have our flag, we put our hand on our heart, and we sing the national anthem. So what I have for you here is a national anthem of biochemistry I'd like you to sing with me. <laughs> Hands on your heart, please, and this is very easy. Oh, beautiful with RNA to make the peptide bonds. You hold tRNA so it can pair up with codons. The ribosome, the ribosome, translate mRNA. Initiate and translocate from start to UGA. Thank you very much for that very solemn rendition there. That relaxed things a little bit, didn't it? Okay. Um, so now that we've gone through and we've talked about transcription in general, and we've talked about translation, it's appropriate that we come back and we deal with the phenomenon known of, as gene expression. Because gene expression really is a description of a very general process in which cells control how much of a given protein that they're making. There's several factors that determine this. We've only talked about before and we said, well, we, we, you know, we, we control enzymes by several things. We had allosteric means and we had covalent modification and whether or not an enzyme was made. And so with gene expression, what I'm going to do is focus in very closely now, because then I uh, focus in very closely on not only if it's made, if a protein is made, but how much is made. That's a very, very important thing for cell. There are several things that contribute to that. I'm going to lead you through some of those as we uh, talk. Okay. Well, this is not a trivial matter, especially, again, I keep, always come back to the eukaryotic cells, but we know eukaryotic cells have very different roles and functions. Okay. Here are, uh, is a list of the proteins that are made in our pancreas. The pancreas is involved in the digestive process and... Uh, plays a very important role in that process, among other things as well. And this is rank in terms of quantity of protein being made. Procarboxypeptidase, okay? That is something that breaks down uh, polypeptides one at a time, one amino acid at a time. It's the most abundant enzyme that's present in, may, or made by the pancreas. If we go over and we look at the proteins made in the liver, we see that the most abundant one there is albumin. This is in terms of percent of total mass, I believe. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, total mRNA, but it's essentially the same thing for our purposes here. All right, so we don't. I mean, we don't see that the same protein is being made in both cells. And in fact, if we take a look at all the proteins here, and we compare them to all the proteins over here, vice versa, there's no matches. That tells us that cells have to, even though they have the identical DNA, pancreas has the same DNA as your liver does, there have to be some very specific controls that allow pancreas cells to make these guys as they're needed and liver cells to make these guys as they're needed. Not surprising, the liver's not involved in digestion. It's not going to be making a lot of digestive uh, proteins because it wouldn't be serving its purpose and the cell would be wasting energy. Okay. Well, that's an introduction uh, to the topic. Now, I'm going to talk about this um, at uh, two levels, uh, prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And uh, I put them onto the same um, setup here, but I think you'll see uh, what's happening um, with these. Now, with prokaryotes, the um, systems that we talk about are relatively simple. They're relatively simple. And they involve mostly control of transcription with a little bit of control of translation. So if we think about the amount of protein that's being made, how much RNA we've got, or messenger RNA we have as a factor, how many times a given messenger RNA gets translated is important. Okay. How stable the protein is after it's been made? Does it get degraded or broken down? That's a factor. So all these are important um, considerations. Well, what I want to talk about first is 
um, something called the lac operon. And before I do that, I need to introduce a term to you. Okay? So the lac operon introduces the term operon. What is an operon and um, how do we uh, deal with it? An operon is a structure that's unique to prokaryotic cells. It's a structure that's unique to prokaryotic cells. And specifically what it is, is a grouping of genes with common functions in the same location on the DNA, or the same you know, approximate location, not overlapping, of course, but same approximate location. I might have, in the case, as I do of the, la of the lac operon, is I have three proteins that are all very important for metabolizing the sugar lactose. And those three proteins are located in the same general place on the DNA, one after the other, okay? One after the other. Now, the advantage of that in E. coli cells is that a single promoter can be used to make a messenger RNA that encodes all three of those. So what that tells us is that not only are they located close to each other, but importantly, a single promoter controls transcription that goes through all three of them. So an operon will always have more than one gene coded on the messenger RNA. Will always have more than one gene coded on the messenger RNA and we will only see this in prokaryotic cells. We will not see it in eukaryotic cells. Big difference. Now, some people argue that, e that prokaryotic cells are actually more advanced than eukaryotic cells. Why would they say that? Well, when we look at what prokaryotic cells do with arrangement of genes, for example, they're way more efficient than we are. Their genes are very tightly clustered, and they cluster according to common features. So, for example, if I need to, if I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an E. coli cell and I encounter the sugar lactose, I only need to turn on one thing to get all the genes for making lactose necessary. I don't need to worry about activating the transcription of 10 different proteins. I only have to activate the transcription of one segment of DNA that's going to code for all three proteins that I need. Right? That's really efficient. Eukaryotic cells are not nearly that efficient. There's reasons why, but in terms of efficiency, prokaryotic cells really win that prize. Okay? Well, so the operon uh, exists in E. coli cell, in prokaryotic cells. It does not exist in eukaryotic cells. Very important consideration. Another thing we have to think about when we think about how it is that we control transcription, which is the first thing we're going to talk about, uh, this control happens at the level of proteins interacting with specific sequences in DNA. I've alluded to these in one case already by the sigma factor. The sigma factor was a protein that was a part of the E. coli RNA polymerase that helped the polymerase to recognize where a promoter was. And that could change depending upon the environmental circumstances. There can be, and in the case of the LAC promoter, there are other proteins that affect whether transcription occurs or not. Okay. One of these that we'll say a fair amount, or I'll say a fair amount about, is known as the LAC repressor. Now, this doesn't tell you a bloody thing about what it does. It's one of the things I don't like about this figure in the book. Okay. What does the LAC repressor do? The LAC repressor, first of all, it's a protein. It's a protein that recognizes a very specific sequence of DNA and it binds to it. Okay? Well, what is the sequence that it binds to? It's a, it's a specific sequence called the operator. The operator is a control region for the lac operon. Okay? What does it mean to say a control region? Well, that control region, if it's bound by the LAC repressor, when it's bound by the repressor, the RNA polymerase cannot transcribe. Pretty cool control. When the LAC operator is bound by the repressor, transcription cannot occur because the LAC, I'm sorry, the RNA polymerase cannot bind 
to the promoter. So the operator is right at the promoter. You can think of it, if you want to, as a part of the promoter. That would be fine. Okay. So we see, in this case, a physical block to transcription. It's covering up the sequence of the promoter by binding to the operator, and it keeps the RNA polymerase. Well, the RNA polymerase has no place to bind. It can't start transcription. It's a very effective way of turning off transcription. I said that when we think about you know, how biological processes go, we say that we, we, we don't usually have something that's either on or off. We usually have, I said, changes in volume, remember? Well, this is an effective on-off switch. Okay? If the repressor is bound, transcription is off. And if the repressor is not bound, then transcription is possible. Okay. Now, before I say that, your book uh, jumps in and throws in some protein structures that I think confuses things, but I'll uh, go with what they've given us to uh, talk about. What you see on the screen are what are called common motifs of proteins. And a motif is a structural um, segment of a protein that's common between different proteins. These motifs are involved in binding to DNA. So when we compare different proteins that we know bind to DNA, we can identify what structural features of those proteins are allowing them to recognize and bind to those specific sequences of DNA. Okay? One of these common motifs that we see in many proteins that bind to DNA are called helix turn helix motif. And it's a specific structure, but across many different proteins, we see the, the same general features of that structure. One of the reasons I don't like figures like this is I look at this and I think, wow, how do I see the common feature that's there? That's a little hard to do, isn't it? Okay. But I can tell you that a helix turn helix motif is a part it's a common feature of proteins that bind to DNA. The LAC repressor is one that has that. Beta strands also um, in uh, certain orientations can uh, facilitate the binding of a protein to DNA. And in this case, you can see these beta strands. This is the, the protein part right here in yellow. is actually sticking itself into the um, DNA double helix and interacting with the hydrogen bonds inside of there. Okay, so again, specific structures uh, that can help to bind to DNA. All right, there are others, and I'm not going to go through uh, them, but I just want you to recognize that and when you think about what a DNA is, it's a double helix, it's a very regular structure, it's a very uh, common structure, and it's not surprising that we're going to see common structures of proteins that are going to bind to it, and that's, that's part of the upshot of what's, what's happening here. Okay, well, let's think about the actual process of, we've got two minutes, the actual process of um, metabolizing lactose. I'm an E. coli cell. I'm floating around in this guy's gut, and the guy hasn't eaten for a long time. Okay? If he doesn't eat, I don't eat. Right? So I'm going to be taking whatever little nutrients I can find and metabolizing those, and being as efficient as I can because I don't want to waste too much energy in doing what I do. All of a sudden, this guy decides to have a glass of milk or an ice cream, and bang, lactose is present because lactose is the most common sugar in found inside of milk. It's a disaccharide. If we look at how bacteria in my gut, I'm this little E. coli that's there, how they respond to the presence of lactose, it's really interesting. Before the meal, the bacteria aren't going to waste any energy whatsoever in making proteins that will break down lactose. But as soon as lactose appears, bang, okay, within uh, a matter of, of minutes, and I don't have a time scale on here, but within a matter of minutes, all right, we see that the proteins, this is one of the proteins here, this is the concentration of protein involved in breaking down lactose, its concentration jumps. Now this means that there's a signal that the cell is reading when lactose is present. And it says, oh, better start making the enzyme to break down lactose. This is the most important enzyme in breaking down lactose. And so we see there's plenty there. This is what's called an inducible gene. It's inducible, meaning that down here we had nothing. Something induced it to start making this particular gene. All right? And the thing that turned out to make this particular gene is a byproduct, as we will see, 
of lactose metabolism. Okay? With that, I think it's a good place to stop, and I'll see you guys on Friday.